So Robin, I would really like to hear uh, some of the excerpts uh, of your book that you read to me this morning that are so uh, Montreal um, and a really interesting relationship with music. Okay, um, I'll start where I started this morning then. This passage this passage takes place in a cafe, Café Résonance, where I played informally for Sundays off and on over a period of nearly three years. Um, I would skip months, but then I would come back. And, and um, I was blessed with key to the cafe to go in in the early morning and practice, which was wonderful because my piano at home is a little upright mm -hmm. and I rarely get a chance to play on a concert grand. In fact, I never got a chance to play on a concert grand. So the, the piano at Resonance is a chickering. It's a, it's a concert grand, a hundred year old concert grand, very beautiful piano. Mm -hmm. I loved my time alone with the chickering. To be able to explore its colors all by myself in the quiet of the empty cafe in the hour after daybreak was an inestimable gift. But it felt unearned. At some point I should have claimed the role of performer at Résonance instead of clinging to the safety of background music. Having failed to make that move, I found myself in a holding pattern that was getting less and less comfortable. Insecurities set in. Were people getting tired of my same old pieces? Even with rotation, did I have enough repertoire to play week after week for so many of the same regulars? Could I learn enough new music quickly enough to justify continuing to play here? My physical distance from people in the cafe was turning into an emotional distance. Sometimes I even felt intimidated by the chickering. Such a big piano, such a serious piano. Who am I to be playing such a piano? The antidote to this malaise was my next venue. Le Dépanneur on Bernard was the other cafe in the neighborhood that hosted musicians, a homey alternative breakfast and lunch place that featured live music all day. Singers, guitarists, pianists, and other instrumentalists signed on for three months, playing a scheduled hour a week. The cafe had Wi-Fi, but the ambiance was social. Young mothers took over the sofas and easy chairs with their infants and preschoolers. Artists and writers sketched and scribbled at small mosaic top tables. Young entrepreneurs worked on cooperative projects at larger tables in the cave-like back room. The owner, an amateur guitar builder, grew his own salads and herbs and kept bees on the roof. The cafe piano was an old dark cabinet upright with no name. Presumably it had been painted over and no high B flat, a string was missing. <laughs> it wasn't a good piano, but neither was it terrible. It was never serviced, but held its pitch through thick and thin, as some old cabinet uprights do. Mm. While it was a come down from the chickering, I welcomed the change. It made me realize my nervousness in performance was directly proportional to the seriousness of the instrument I was playing. This wasn't a problem with no name. <laughs> the challenges here were different. The cafe had a front that opened to the street with the piano just a few feet inside. If it started to rain, I felt drops. It was an exercise in concentration to have to compete not only with kitchen racket, but with the traffic on Bernard passing within a stone's throw of where I sat. Whether it was the cappuccino machine or a garbage truck, something always seemed to drown out the most expressive passages as I came to them. And if distance from the audience was an issue at resonance, here there was a table near enough to the base end of the piano that I worried I could knock over a coffee with my elbow in an energetic passage. But I liked that the piano was right in the midst of things here. I could feel people listening. Their faces were friendly when I turned to acknowledge them. Many expressed pleasure at hearing classical music in that venue. I felt comfortable and relaxed playing on the no name in a cafe full of suntanned bodies and summer happy voices. Mm. Around this time, street pianos reappeared in the neighborhood a city initiative begun the summer before to make pianos available outdoors and in public spaces for anyone who wanted to play them. The pianos were donated and given to local artists to decorate. They were old uprights, junkers, some more playable than others. It was fun to play these pianos if I found one available when walking by. Hearing others play them was fun too. And who would guess there were so many pianists in the city eager to share their playing, classical, popular, jazz, 
some serious students, some penniless music graduates, the occasional retired professional, gifted amateurs of all ages. The pianos were like magnets, drawing all of these, as well as children taking lessons, toddlers with their parents. Small dramas happened around them every day. One morning in August, in the little square called Parc de Portugal, across from Leonard Cohen's house, where three years later Montrealers would gather in a spontaneous vigil to mourn his passing and sing his songs, I took turns playing one of these pianos with a young man who told me he was self-taught except for a few months of lessons as a child. The park was quiet that morning, but we had a rapt and loquacious audience of one, hunched like a small gargoyle on the edge of the gazebo where the piano had been placed, was a skinny woman in jeans with a scraggly gray ponytail, rough skin, and a missing tooth. She told us she was going to sit by the piano all day, as she had been doing every day, parce que j'adore la musique, j'adore écouter les personnes qui peuvent jouer. She said she had lived 40 years in the neighborhood after growing up in northern Quebec. Her parents were very poor, no money for music lessons, no piano, but they could get records by mail order subscription and she sent away for every single one, listened to them religieusement, c'était ma passion. She wanted one of us to show her how to play chopsticks, which she had once learned from a friend as a child, but she was hard to instruct. We both tried, but she gave up quickly, shaking her head. It was as if she thought she didn't have the right, that pianos were for people who knew how. Suddenly I had the idea of asking her to play piano with me, she came shyly, but with childlike delight in her face, and I showed her, as I had done with my younger siblings and later with my children, how to play an alternating fifth on low F, repeating it in a steady rhythm. Once she had established the beat, I began playing the melody of Albert Elmenreich's spinning song, for which her part was the bass line, and as soon as she heard it, she cried in astonishment, J'accompagne! <laughs> her excitement was contagious. In French, I told her, she didn't need to play chopsticks. She could just play piano, that anyone could play, the way anyone can make a drawing, given paper and crayon. Music is drawing with sounds. Try it. Just doodle something on the piano, and I'll draw with you. I showed her we could have a dialogue on the piano, responding to each other's musical doodles, and that she could also do this by herself, one hand answering the other. You see, you don't have to wait for somebody to come play the piano. You can play, too. Listen to the sounds you make. Let the piano be your teacher. Almost at once, she began to imitate figures I was playing and to explore a little. Oh, she kept saying, Vous m'avez fait tellement heureuse aujourd'hui. She had made me happy too. Mm. That's lovely, Robin. Thank you.